Good evening. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County and our co-sponsors, welcome to this forum for candidates for Eatonville School District position four and the at-large position. Thank you to the candidates and to the audience for taking time to participate in this forum. I am Liz Knox, co-moderator from the League of Women Voters, Tacoma Pierce County, and moderating with me tonight is Bailey Womble, a recent graduate from the University of Washington, Tacoma. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization whose mission for the past 102 years has been to encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in government. We conduct candidate forums to provide voters with information on which to base their votes. League of Women Voters Tacoma Pierce County wishes to acknowledge that we gather on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people surrounded by their traditional waters in the shadow of Mount Tahoma. We actively seek inclusive and respect respectful partnerships that honor indigenous cultures, histories, identities, and current realities. This forum is for the primary election, which is August 1st. Forums for this election are held only for races in which there are three or more candidates. When the League holds a, holds a forum, all candidates are invited. At this forum in alphabetical order are uh, Karen Carr for position four and Kim Williams for the at large position. Corey Ackerman was unable to be with us uh, this evening. Ground rules have been sent in advance to the candidates. Candidates, do you each agree to follow the ground rules, including agreeing to those regarding any recording of this forum and to speak only to the issues, not about each other? Please indicate your agreement to all ground rules with a thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, questions for tonight will be 60 seconds in length. Our timekeeper is Terry Baker. She will hold up cards when you have 30 seconds remaining, 15 seconds remaining, and when it is time to stop. When you see the stop card, you may finish a short sentence. Please stay on gallery view so that you can see the timekeeper and the moderators. Also, please mute yourself when it is not your turn to speak. Each candidate has up to two minutes for an opening statement. These will be given in alphabetical order. After that, the order of answering questions will rotate. Each candidate will get the same amount of time to answer in every case. At the end, closing statements may be up to one minute and will be given in reverse order of the opening statements. If you have a question for these candidates, uh, please text the question to 253-948-6029. Depending on the number of questions submitted, we may not be able to get to them all. The order of opening two minute statements again in alphabetical, is again in alphabetical order. So we will start with Karen Carr. Hi, um, I'm Karen Carr. Uh, I am an Eatonville resident. I've um, been a resident for uh, 15 years. I've put four kids through the school district. I've taught in the school district for eight years. Uh, as a paraeducator, I did um, media specialist. So I taught library, technology, and STEM for K through eight. I've taught at all of the schools except for the high school. So I've been at four schools in our district. Um, I've been a, a member of the community. I've been a, a member of um, a, a local church in town for, oh goodness, over 20 years before I actually lived here. That's where I met my husband. Um, anyways, I, I am excited uh, to, to run, hopefully gain votes to win. And uh, I, I just, um, I feel that I can make a huge difference in um, what is going on with our school because I feel like I have um, hands-on experience and uh, I know the needs of our children. I've seen um, what's happening firsthand with our kids in the district, as well as with my own child who is a student in the district. Um, I, I just wanted to jump in and uh, get hands on and I felt like I would be a better advocate for the students on the school board. I felt that I was no longer making as big of a difference as I needed to or wanted to as a district employee. So I actually quit my job uh, within the district to apply for a seat on the school board um, and to be able to run. So thank you. And I, I appreciate uh, your guys' invite and my opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Now, Kim Williams. Hello, um, my name is Kim Williams and I am also a resident of Eatonville. Um, 
I am somewhat new in that I moved here recently, but my family has been here for at least four generations. My great aunt founded the Pioneer Farm Museum, and um, I have many family members that have gone through the Eatonville School District. I, um, I was a former teacher for six years, a public education teacher, and I also taught in K through 12. So I was a high school teacher by trade, English teacher, but I also worked in the middle school and elementary schools in Nevada, in Virginia. And then I went back to school and got my master's in film and media. And now um, I taught at the uh, college level as an adjunct professor for several years, seven plus years. So um, have a lot of experience as an educator. Um, I have been coming to Eatonville since I was very little. And so I know the people and the, the place well. Um, and now that I live here, I have two kids in the district, uh, one uh, in Eatonville and one at Columbia Crest. And um, I just felt called to also throw my hat into the ring and see how I could put my expertise to use here. Um, there were some issues that popped up as soon as we moved here that I thought was really interesting and, and scary. And so I wanted to see if uh, there's something to do with my expertise here with those issues. <laughs> no, uh, thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Hi. So as far as the things that the district has done well over the last five years, um, I would say going back to about five years ago, I was uh, very pleased with the district. It was my happy place. Uh, I love being a part of it. Uh, we were, we were, things were just changing and we were doing great things in Eatonville. Um, I had uh, even hosted our mayor in, my, or his, his wife. Um, he did visit our school, but I hosted his wife for a lunch in my library, uh, you know, because we were a STEM school. Um, every school in our district had become STEM. Um, we had also been endorsed as green schools. Uh, we had been starting gardens. We had been starting food programs for kids and uh, sharing food. Um, we we were just uh, we we were fast forward into being a very special um, community, a very special school district uh, that was had um, you know we we had different things to offer than the average or other schools around. So we were being visited by other districts for what we were doing. Uh, I was personally involved with um, you know requesting and writing for some of the grants and. Uh, you know, it was just, it was a great space. Um, we, the, the town was um, very sorry, that's involved. Time. We had families involved. We had excuse uh, me, that's huge time. involvement where um, okay, Ms. Ms. Carr, that's time. what was happening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now okay. I can't. our next question, we'll start with Karen. And the question is, what are the biggest budgetary needs you see in the near future in the school district and how will you address those needs? Tough question to answer as far as how will I address the needs of um, the budget as far as, um, you know, it will be a group talked about effort and uh, we will figure that out as a, a board. Um, as far as the budget needs, we definitely need to address the biggest ones I see is uh, <laughs> budget for parent educators and bus drivers um, and having the, uh, you know, enough employees to get our kids to and from school. Uh, and um, th those are the big, biggest ones is the lack of pay for paras and bus drivers. So, yes, the biggest budgetary needs that I've been hearing about our busing, um, you know, get, making sure the kids are able to get to school, um, and then support for the teachers and the um, educators and all of the staff and, you know, faculty that need to get paid for the work that they're doing, plus bringing on the right amount of support and staff to help the youth and the students that need that support. Um, 
And then, <laughs> sorry, the sign just came up. And then um, mental health support, you know, getting more uh, youth the help they need for around the issues that we're dealing with in our culture and that are, you know, rapidly increasing. So that's it. For our next question, we'll be starting with Kim Williams. Uh, the next question is, how would you help to create a climate in our schools to lessen the incidence of bullying? And what steps would you take to ensure the school district addresses this issue? Yeah, this is a tough subject. Um, the work that I do, and I, that I, the work that I've done for the nonprofit that I work for, we work a lot around um, empowering youth through um, social emotional learning, which is a hot topic. This is a word or phrase that people are, you know, wary of, I guess, but um, we need to build empathy in our youth. We need to help youth, you know, understand each other better. And I think there are programs, there are um, activities, there is way to build culture and support in our schools. Um, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, restorative justice, circle building, and, um, you know, giving the youth the opportunity to find ways to help um, support each other. So we need, there's a lot of work there and there's a lot of ways to do the work. We just have to be willing to do it. Thank you. Next, Karen Carr. I, as far as um, lessen it, lessening the incidence of bullying, I uh, definitely think that there needs to be a hands-on approach with uh, training, with possible um, classes, bringing in outside resources into our district, um, not just assemblies. Uh, I feel that there needs to be consequences uh, for the behavior. Seconds. I feel that... Um, if it's outside counseling that's needed for students that have a repeated offense of bullying or severe bullying that they um, definitely need addressed to protect the students that are being bullied. I, um, I have seen firsthand uh, extreme bullying. I've seen where I have, I've had, you know, a child in my classroom uh, not wanting to live anymore because he was severely bullied. I've seen him move to a different um, area and, um, and flourish and not deal with that. Um, we just, we, we definitely need hands on. It can't be overlooked. It cannot be something that the board is not paying attention to or they don't think is a big deal because it's a huge deal. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. And, and we can. start with you for our next question. It has been an increase in challenges to materials in public school libraries and classrooms in various places. <laughs> what is your position on censorship? Okay. And how should challenges to library and curriculum materials be handled? And Karen, go ahead, please. Well, first off, I, oh, thank you. First off, I feel just knowing what's in your library. I feel that uh, the board should know what's in there so there's no surprises. When there's a confrontation or a parent coming to ask questions, uh, they, should, they should know the materials and the curriculum at hand. We should definitely be involved in that. Uh, as far as censor censorship, I, I don't agree with uh, extreme censorship. Um, as a librarian, I definitely monitored what my students checked out per request my parents so if, if there was a parent with a belief and they came to me and they said they did not want their child reading something um i supported that i supported the parent I, um, you know and so i i watched what the kid uh you know and it, it never was an issue you know i mean as far as that goes it's not like a kid i uh, came and wanted to check out something that the parent you know didn't agree with Oh. Um, I, I just feel that there needs to be a relationship with parents, with the board, with everybody to just know, but I do not agree oh. with actually censoring the library and removal of books. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I trust our, our, our librarians and teachers inherently to provide our libraries and our classrooms with the materials that reflect the school districts that our students are in. Um, 
And whenever book banning or censorship is part of a community, you know, it can devolve into so much more. So, you know, our country is built upon freedom of speech and it's hard for us to uh, justify banning things when, um, when we're supposed to be about uh, having access. So just like sex education, if the kids' parents want to opt out, maybe that is a way to uh, address this issue with the uh, school district, the school district Eatonville, and um, the board being a part of get, making that an opportunity. Um, but once we ban books, then, you know, it, it devolves. So our society devolves. We need to make sure we keep our liberties in place. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. And for this next question, we'll be starting with Kim Williams again. Uh, given that Eatonville is a small district, how will you provide adequate educational services for the full range of students, including both struggling learners and those who are high achieving? Froze the first part when you repeated the question, it froze. So I didn't hear it again. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> given that Eatonville is a small district, how will you provide adequate educational services for the full range of students, including both struggling learners and those who are high achieving? Well, um, you know, it's part of what we guarantee as you know, Washington state law has said that all students need to have access to a quality education um, and all types of learners. And so it's up to the district to make sure that that is correct and possible. Um, Making sure that that is what happens here in Eatonville. I, you know, the community has concerns around uh, transparency and having uh, a say in how that is done. So making sure that all students have access and the ability to have a quality public education that meets their needs will be very important to, you know, try to attain um, or achieve. So talking with people about how to do that, the parents, the teachers, and the school board together and the administration is going to be what the kind of problem solving that we're going to have to do. Thank you. Now it's uh, Karen Carr's turn. Thank you. Um, I, I'm right there. I think it all starts with the administration and school board and then um, counselors as far as, uh, you know, having, um, transparency and being able to talk with parents, uh, getting to know the children um, and uh, providing the tools for the teachers that need it. Um, if there's, a, um, you know, being involved as far as, um, you know, setting up IEPs or 504 plans or um, meeting the students where they're at, or um, if they're high achieving, um, making sure that we are meeting everything and listening to the parents, uh, being available for them when the parents come into the school, uh, making sure that, or coming to board meetings, whatnot, making sure that the parents don't feel blown off, that they're being heard, yes. that their uh, kids are getting the needs met, that they um, are, you know, feeling that maybe there's a lack of uh and um being willing to humble themselves and and address what is at hand uh to give them the um the the education that they need and uh, um yeah and just being there caring for the kids thank you thank you karen and we're going to start with you for the next question the next question is this data from the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction shows that there is a gap in readiness in the six areas assessed for kindergartners entering Eatonville schools. 72% of girls demonstrate school readiness for kindergarten, while 57% of boys demonstrate school readiness. What would you propose to improve readiness for students entering kindergarten? And Karen, we'll start with you. Uh, I mean, I think that would go to, thank you. I think that would go to um, having the programs available for Head Start or preschool, um, which Eatonville has uh, attempted to do. I mean, we've, we've started preschool programs in our district. Uh, I would say since about 2018, maybe it was 19 when we really got on board 
with having preschool available um, and having low income preschool available for uh, parents. 30 seconds. So, uh, you know, they, uh, I, I believe they're still, the program is still going. Um, so that, that is a huge thing. And, and I, I think with everything, it probably takes four or five years to catch up and we had COVID in there. So we really need to be focusing on those preschool programs to ready the kids. Also, uh, I'm a firm believer that kids um, are ready at different ages. I mean, I, I've talked to many doctors and, uh, you know, school teachers, everybody dealing with my own kids that, uh, you know, there's just there's a time when stuff starts to click. And I, I'm Thank not you, sure if there is a difference between girls and boys Stop. on on that. Thank I would you. be interested in finding Thank out the staff. Your, your time is out now. Thank you. And um, now we'll go to Kim Williams, the same question. Can you repeat, coming from a district where my children went before Eatonville School District, they both had access to preschool three and pre-K four. And so they started school at three years old and benefited greatly from having been in school for two years prior to kindergarten. So I know for a fact that programs like Head Start and preschool work, and it would, you know, greatly benefit the students of Eatonville if that were available. My understanding, there is a preschool program here. Um, and so it's probably helping some, but access um, and getting students to that program and it being affordable is a big uh, hurdle if it's not free. And then of course, you know, if it's Head Start and it is affordable or free, then being able to get the youth that are supposed to be there there is going to be an issue because of the you know, demographics and geography of, of the area. So we really should build those up as much as possible because they do help. Thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, Kim Williams, you'll start with this next question. What will you do to help with a successful transition to the new superintendent? <laughs> uh, well, I sat in on the superintendent search meeting um, because I was curious to see who the candidates were and what Eatonville School District was looking for as a new superintendent without knowing any background or what was happening. So I was very pleased to see uh, that they chose the person that I thought would be the best candidate of the four that were interviewed. And so um, I'm excited to, you know, get have the possibility or a chance to work with somebody who is coming from a district that is um, so much larger that has been dealing with a lot of the issues that are trickling down into Eatonville. Um, and so I think has the experience needed to uh, take some of these harder topics head on. And so welcoming him will not be a difficult uh, challenge because I think it's an exciting time for Eatonville School District. And I think the new superintendent is going to do a fabulous job. I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes and being a part of it if I can. Thank you so much. Next week, Karen Carr. Yeah. I um I I plan on welcoming welcoming him and uh you know I've met with uh, Jay and I uh, had a you know short conversation with him and uh he seemed like a really really nice guy. Uh, I think that his background um, with psychology and everything, like he needs, he knows how to slow down. He knows how to uh, take the time and hear people. I think that um, his, uh, overall, his uh, attitude as far as, I, I think he's going to have that um, welcoming attitude, that, that uh, personality that I feel that parents and stakeholders are going to feel like they're heard. Uh, when they are talking to him. So I think that's a huge thing that um, he he just has a down to earth seconds. personality from what I can see. I have never heard a negative thing about him. Um, I have a sister that teaches in the Bethel School District. She, uh, you know, says a bunch of great things about him. Um, you know, I, I've just heard lots of encouraging Thank you. things that um, they think Thank that you. he's going to be a good fit for our district. So um, without having a further thank you, thank you with him. Thank you. Um, and this uh, relates a little bit to the, the comment that I heard about racism in the district. So how would you approach racism in the school district 
And how would you approach curriculum adoption to ensure that it includes accurate information about racism in American history? So as far as racism in the school district, um, I, I didn't see a lot of that, uh, you know, when I was up at Columbia Crest. I didn't see a lot of that at Weyerhaeuser. I didn't see it at the elementary school level. Um, and I, honestly, my years in the district uh, at the middle school were COVID years, so I didn't see it firsthand there. Um, I, I do believe that we have some great programs, um, uh, but teaching kindness, teaching that everybody's the same, you know, and then uh, teaching, uh, you know, I mean, we, we do have some great history lessons and I I feel like, you know, yeah, definitely just having the awareness of what um, people have gone through in the past uh, and, um, you know, just being, being a, a, just your, your classroom has to be hands on um, as far as uh, having, um, have, you know, your, your school has to support and have hands on as far as having oh. the curriculum that um, teaches uh you know that our our history so uh -huh. um I, I think that you know we we have a pretty good start on that and i i didn't experience racism uh -huh. for thank you oh, um <clears throat> this is you know a tough tough topic obviously um the issue of racism in the district i think is uh not exactly um I think people aren't exactly aware how pervasive it might be. Um, my cousins who went through the district in the 90s said that it was an issue back then. So I don't think it's gone away. Um, we moved here halfway through the year and my friend's child told me that the N-word was being used in the middle school hallways this year. And that terrifies me. So how do we address this issue where we have young people in this district learn to respect each other, regardless of race, you know, and all of the other things that define the demographics that define our youth. So we need to find ways to combat it. Adopting textbooks that have accurate information is very important. And so making sure that the school board does a good job of that will be of utmost importance to me when we, it, when and if I am elected to the school board. Thank you. <clears throat> and Kim, we'll start with you for this next question. How will you encourage civic education, student engagement in government and voter registration for high school students? Well, uh, when I had government in high school, I loved my teacher so much. He made us memorize the preamble and it got us excited about, and we had to read newspaper clips and got us excited about the news because it was relevant to current events and history. And so um, I think it's really important that, especially with these past four years of you know explaining how civics works, how democracy works, how voting matters, and getting students excited about that process is um, a challenge, but also important to do. Um, and because I was excited about it from my teacher when I was in school, um, I believe that it's possible to share that excitement with young people in a district like this. So I'm hoping to be able to have the opportunity to do so. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Karen Carr. I think the high school students should um, definitely have government and civics classes. Uh, um, I took a law class in high school that I thought was a lot of fun, uh, just to put, put you out there and uh, get you into current events. I think that we should, uh, you know, for the seniors that are, you, you know, getting ready to turn 18, I think, uh, you know, there, there should be a, a voter's registration, teaching them how to vote, you know, registrate. I don't, I don't think there'd be anything wrong with that, having, uh, you know, a time in school where they can register to vote and get their, uh, you know, ID cards and everything set up by the, you know, for when they are 18. Um, you know, because I know you can do it online. It's easy peasy. Uh, you go online, it takes like five minutes and you're registered to vote. So I, I think seconds. the school should definitely be hands-on in teaching that. The same as, you know, teach them how to write a check, you know, or 
um, basic home economics. That's, that's part of living. So I, I think we can, we can definitely foster and encourage and make it a fun event to um, get them all registered to vote or show them how to do it by the time they're 18. Thank you, Karen. And Karen, you will start with this next question. How do you envision helping the most vulnerable students achieve success and graduate, especially those who are homeless, migrants, live in foster care, or have disabilities? What programs and supports should we have to help them succeed? Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge question. Um, because right now I, you know, can say that I, I necessarily don't agree with um, what happens with kids with the um, extra need in high school. I uh, feel that they are pushed out. I feel that they are encouraged to go to um, Washington Online Academy or some other homeschool program that is not involved with the school to keep our numbers up and uh, our graduation rate up. Uh, I, I don't feel that those students are being met where they need to be met. I, I feel like once the district sees that they are uh, going to be a challenge and uh, on the road to not uh, graduating, that they encourage the kids to do, do some seconds. other program that's not within the district. And I've seen that firsthand with my own eyes. So um, I, I, don't, I, I want that to change. So that, that's a big deal to me. To, to meet the students and uh, try to lift them up uh, and get them on the route of graduating. I have seen thank teachers you. be involved with kids and um, we need more of those teachers to be hands-on to get them to do summer school or school over spring break or what. Mm, excellent. Uh, and Kim, would you like me to repeat the question? Please. Absolutely. How do you envision helping the most vulnerable students achieve success and graduate, especially those who are homeless, migrants, live in foster care, or have disabilities? What programs and supports should we have to help them succeed? Well, um, you know, within any community that has a lot of different, um, you, you know, people who are willing to support the disenfranchised and young people who are struggling that need more support and help. Um, you know, there are nonprofits that are stepping up to do those kinds of things. I hear that is prevalent in this district, um, but also, you know, because Eatonville School District and Eatonville itself is has this community, you know, small community type scenario, um, it doesn't make any sense why any young people should fall through the cracks. And we must put programs in place to help those that need it the most. Um, so in addition to nonprofits that are doing the work already, um, you know, finding ways to bring these youth back in, whether it's through, you know, programs like, um, oh my gosh, it escapes me, the one that's out uh, here in the valley. <laughs> that help you young people learn about, you know, forestation and um, growing Thank food you. and things like that. So I don't know, there's a lot of different ways that we could go about. Thank it. you. Thank you very much. And now it's time for closing statements. Candidate has up to one minute for a closing statement. We will reverse the order of the opening statements. And so we will begin with Kim Williams. Kim, your closing statement, please. Thank you. I've enjoyed this process. It's uh, definitely a good way to think about all of the important issues that are that Eatonville School District has to deal with. Um, I think that I bring expertise and an outside experience and perspective that would be helpful to the Eatonville School Board, but also um, being from the area through family and having been here for many generations, I understand. Uh, a lot what is needed. And I think that um, I have the, I have what it takes to help bring those issues to the forefront and help solve them. When I still have 30 seconds. <laughs> so I hope that people will give me a chance. I really look forward to being here in the district and helping, you know, work through a lot of these issues that are very hard, but um, with the right community support and the right people who are willing to work together, I think that we could tackle them. Thank you, thank you. And now, Karen Carr, your closing statement, please. 
Well, I'd like to say thank you for the invite and being able to be here. I'm uh, thankful to be able to see and uh, at least see and put a face on um, Kim because I haven't I haven't met her yet. I didn't know who she was or anything. So I'm at least uh, thankful to hear her views and um, to know that there's uh, capable hands uh, that we have a good group of candidates. So um, as far as that goes, I uh, you know definitely feel that I have uh, the insights, the knowledge. Um, I have firsthand uh, uh, knowledge of um, the bullying situations within the school. I have firsthand knowledge of the curriculum that I've seen within the district. Uh, I um, have uh, my uh, kids. I know what my son is facing right now and has been facing throughout the last few years. I know our, I know our lack and how the majority of our students are behind because of COVID and we need to figure out how to meet them um, and bring them up to speed because they are, uh, uh, most of them are at least a year behind as far as their uh, academic Stop. school, especially in the younger grades. So thank you. Stop. Thank you. And that uh, brings us to the end of our forum for this evening. I'd like to thank the candidates who joined us tonight, Karen Carr and Kim Williams. Thank you also to our community co-sponsors, the Affordable Housing Consortium, the Summit Waller Community Association, the NAACP Tacoma Branch, Latinx Unidos of the South Sound, the Tacoma and Puyallup Valley branches of the AAUW and the Tacoma Urban League. Oh, got it. For viewers, please be sure to vote for the candidate of your choice before Election Day, August 1st. You should already have your ballots, so please mail or use a drop box to deliver your ballot as early as possible. Thank you also to our timekeeper, Terry Baker, and to Cynthia Stewart, our Zoom master, and to the committee who planned this forum. Be sure to read your voters pamphlet, look up vote411.org. Again, that's vote411.org, where you can find answers to, to questions posed to the candidates. Thank you for watching, have a good evening, and please don't forget to vote. Thank you.